Everybody. Welcome to an incredibly special edition of In the Neighborhood today. Uh, it's me and Mandy Stobel and a very special guest all the way from Florida, David Lenevsky. Uh, hi, David. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Hello to you both. <laughs> Let me, uh, I'm going to do a terrible introduction of you, David, and then you can fix it for me. David has make been. It, make it short. Make it short, please. <laughs> Real short. David Lenevsky is, a, uh, is an attorney in New York City who I met because he has a second career and a second passion, which is art. And for decades, he's been studying and learning about art and taking people through his own world of great art, especially at the Met in, Toronto, in uh, New York, where I've gotten to go with him. And it's, uh, it's a moving and beautiful experience. And he's here with us today. Is that accurate? Is that fairly close, David? That's good enough. Stop. <laughs> tell, me, tell me when I should stop. Okay, well, let me, why don't you... I'll set up the, uh, the email I sent you. And so David is this great art guy. And I said, Mandy and I, Mandy, obviously you're an artist. Uh, so I thought, Mandy, you and I, you gotta, you gotta experience David. But I said, can you go through your, the paintings you know of in history and talk about a different pandemic and how, that, how art related to that? Is that accurate? And it sure is. Okay, uh, Mandy, are you ready for this? I am so excited about this. Okay. I am so ready. All right, so take it away, David. Okay, so thank you both very much. I want to tell you that this is the first time I'm giving a talk sitting down. Or <laughs> importantly, it's the first time I'm giving a talk in a bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> so let's, let's go to Italy. And let's go back to the Italian Renaissance. And let's look at how art, painting in the Italian Renaissance handled a pandemic that they experienced. The year is 1348. It's called the Black Death. It was a pandemic far, far more damaging and horrible than what we are experiencing today. The Italian re re Renaissance represents a radical and sudden and sharp break from tradition. And in order for me to demonstrate that sharp break from tradition, I need to show you a painting that was done before the Renaissance in Italy in the 1200s. So let's look at the first painting. All right. This is done by Berlinguero, who was an artist in Lucca, which is a town north of Florence. He was active to the best of our knowledge for a short period of eight years between 1228 and 1236. And it has all of the characteristics of art in Italy before the Italian Renaissance. Namely, this is an art in which the artist has absolutely no interest whatsoever in what I call anatomical accuracy. So faces are stylized. They are not individualized. Eyes tend to be arm in shape. The nose tends to be long and tapered. The mouth tends to be perched. And if you saw a figure full length from feet to head, you would see that the figures are elongated, exaggerated, extended. We don't have a full length figure of Mary here, but look at her right fingers. The fingers are elongated, exaggerated, extended. 
because the elongated, the exaggerated, the extended was thought to be inherently more beautiful than the normally proportioned figures. Mm. This is an art in which the artist has absolutely no interest in naturalism, in the world of nature. So figures are flat. They're two-dimensional. They have none of our bulk and weight. They have none of our solidity, of our plasticity, of our volumetric forms, the spacious volumes of our real bodies. This is an art in which the artist has no interest whatsoever in producing illusionistic space, the third dimension through linear perspective. So this is what I call an artificial art. Artificial is not a bad word. This is an art that I love. This is an art that I go out of my way to see. This is a very emotional art, but it's an artificial art because it is based upon prototypes, not life studies. There's a prototype for a Mary. There's a prototype for an infant Christ child. There's a prototype for the events in the Old and the New Testament, whether it's the birth of Christ or the death of Christ. It's an art in which the artist has no interest in visual reality, painting the real world. He has no interest in optical observation, painting the real world. Mm. Now, let's go to painting number two. Mm -hmm. this is now amazing. we have Giotto. Giotto, G-I-O-T-T-O, is one of the most revolutionary artists in all Western civilization. He brings us in to the Italian Renaissance in painting. He's born sometime between the year 1266 and 1277. We know for sure he died in the year 1337. And during the years 1305 and 1308, he paints in Padua, Italy, the Arena Chapel also known as the Scrovini Chapel for the name of the man who paid for it. And the Scrovini Chapel, Giotto paints the life story of the Virgin and the life story of Christ. This particular panel is Joachim takes refuge. Joachim, the figure on the left, is the future father of the Virgin. But at this moment in time, he has no child and he's been expelled from the temple because it is a sin to be without child. And he goes back to his farm like, and you can see he is sad, he's depressed, he's downcast, but you can see a real body. He's got bulk and weight. He's got our volumetric forms. He has our spacious volumes. Go back to picture number two. There it is, yeah. And he is a real figure standing on a real ground. And you can see the two figures next to him. They are looking at each other because they know something is wrong, but they don't know what's wrong with Joachim. And we, the viewer, know that they know something is wrong also. Mm -hmm. So what we have is real figures, real people, expressing an emotional moment, a psychological moment, an emotion. And we have these real figures, humanism, with real psychological emotions. In a world of nature, now we have a blue sky, a real sky. We have trees. So what does Shadow do? Shadow brings us the world of naturalism, the world of nature, and he brings us the world of humanism, real people with a psychological moment. Giotto, in essence, brings us back 1800 years, 2000 years to the classical Greeks, what the Greeks gave us in the sixth and fifth century BC, humanism and naturalism. Mm -hmm. So this is painted between the years 1305 and 1308. The decade of the 1330s and the 1340s are awful in Florence, in Tuscany, in Italy. We have the Arno River, which goes right through Florence, flooding, a huge flood. It takes out some of the uh, medieval walls surrounding the city. 
we have agricultural failure two years in a row, 1346 to 1345, skip one year, 1347. We have bank failures, the Barty Bank, the Peruzzi Bank fails. And in 1348, we have the big one, the Black Death, a world pandemic. In Florence, half the population dies within days, within weeks, within months. Half the population, 1348. There are no bulldozers. How do you bury 45,000 people? There's no managerial expertise. There are no helicopters. There are no computers. There are no health facilities. Society collapsed. Obviously, half your population dies in a month, two months, a couple of weeks. Society dies. And so too does the artistic community. I'm fond of saying that artists, Mandy, you will appreciate this more than most people, artists are a function of their particular idiosyncrasies and their individual genius, but they are also a function of the political activities, the economic conditions, the social values of the society within which he or she is working. Mm -hmm. Society collapsed. The artistic community collapsed. Let me have the third painting, please. And so what we have is a reaction. We have a return to the mysticism, to the neo-medievalism of the 1200s. We go back to the gold background. We go back to the black figures. We go back to the austerity and the severity of the figures. This is not an engrossing and engaging Christ and God. This is the church saying to you, Renaissance people, you think that the Renaissance that stands for the proposition that joy in this life replaced the fixation on the next life, that the Renaissance stood for the proposition of we're no longer primarily concerned with life after life, that we are now primarily concerned with life today. Well, after the Black Death, during the Black Death, there was, again, a return to the neo, medieval, neo medieval philosophy of austerity and severity. And that's what happened to the artistic community. Mm. But no. if you would have asked me in the abstract, how long society would have taken mm -hmm. after experiencing the Black Death in 1348? How long would it have taken Florence to recover? I would have said at least a century, at least 100 years. How do you lose a, half your population under those conditions and not take 100 years to revive? Mm -hmm. Back to the matter is it only took half that time, half a century, 50 years. And around the year 1400, let me have the next painting, please. We go to a style that we call the international style because it's a style that happened in Florence, it happened in Germany, in Spain, in England, it was international. And this is an art of happiness. The artists are saying, we're alive. We made it out. Mm -hmm. We're here. And this is a court life. The courts are exuberant. This is an art in which, yes, there is a gold background, but gold not only reflects a color that is appropriate for these holy figures, gold is rich. And these paintings are rich. Mary is uh, dressed in a rich garment. And we have a very lovely face on Mary a serene face, a happy face, a contented face, so too with the infant Christ child. And we have musicians in the background. They're playing music. This is an art of hallelujah. We made it. We're alive. And it's an art of wonderful, curvy, linear forms and shapes of her dress and of the place where she's sitting. This is what I call visual poetry. Mm -hmm. And at this time, also, in a couple of years, 
I love looking at this painting. It's so wonderful. It's so, oh, it's so beautiful. You know, it's so engaging. I mean, no matter what you are, you're Jewish, you're Hindu, you're Buddhist, you're, I don't care what you are, you look at this face of Mary and the infant Christ child, and you're engaged. Mm -hmm. You get it. And if you don't get it, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I was rate. about I was about to say I don't get it, but I won't say that now, will I? <laughs> yeah. So what happens also now is we go into what I call the second Renaissance. Giotto brought us the first Renaissance in painting, first decade of the 1300s. First decade, second decade of the 1400s, we go into the second Renaissance. And let me have the next painting, please. And this is by Masaccio. Masaccio tragically lives only 27 years. He's born in 1401, he dies in 1428. He paints this a year or two before he dies. It's a very, very important painting. It brings us into the second Renaissance. Masaccio does in the early 1400s, what Chateau did in the early 1300s. And we have real people, real bodies, solid bodies, muscular bodies, the bulk and weight of real people standing on a real ground in nature underneath a blue sky. And we have the tribute money. What we have here is the figure with his back towards us in the middle of the painting. He's a tax collector, a Roman tax collector. And he goes to Christ and he says, pay your tax. And Christ, to the shock of his disciples, the apostles surrounding him, say, okay, I'll pay. And Christ tells St. Peter, go to the river, the Jordan River. There he is in the left-hand corner. And he's going to make a miracle. Catch a fish, open the mouth of the fish, and take out a gold coin. And here Peter is on his right, paying the gold coin to the tax collector. But what does Jano do artistically? He's a show off. He's a young man, like all young men, they love to show off. He paints his apostles in a semicircle. He's saying to you, I can paint the real figure in depth in a semicircle. I don't need to line the apostles up in a straight line left to right. I can paint them in illusionistic space, what the artists of the 1200s had no interest in doing. And he paints the halos on these apostles in the third dimension. And look at the faces of the apostles. These are real people. These are not angelic apostles. These are people in the street of Florence. Why? Because Masaccio is making, besides a very important, artistic statement of painting the real world. He's making a very important political statement. This is what I would call in America, soft money. This reminds me of my client, Dick Morris, who represented <laughs> President Clinton. And Clint, President Clinton had so much money, he couldn't spend it on direct advertisement. And Dick came up with the idea, well, we don't need direct advertisement. We can just go on television and radio and the newspapers. Don't even mention the president's name. Just talk about issues without mentioning anybody's name. Masaccio was doing the same thing here because at this time, Florence is under a threat of attack by both Milan and Naples. And the, the, the government of Florence wants to tax the people in what I think is the first graduated income tax in all of Western Europe. And of course the church is saying, you can't tax me. Mr. Brancacci commissions this painting and what Mr. Brancacci is saying, look, if Christ agreed to pay his tax 1300 years ago, mm -hmm. you the church today pay the tax to the Florence government. So this is a great painting, both artistically and politically. And it's a wonderful example of how artists are a function of the political activities and the economic conditions and the social values of the society within which they live. So let me sum this up. What the Italian Renaissance in painting 
how it handled the Great Black Death. It is a story of survival. The Renaissance survived, and I am convinced in my read of history that we have built into us a very heavy DNA component of survival. The Black Death was just one of many, many horrible historical events in which humankind survived. It is also, though, the Italian Renaissance and the Black Death, an example of human renewal. It was survival and renewal. We went into a second Renaissance. Whether or not our society today survives, it certainly will. Whether or not we will go into a period of renewal, come back and ask me after <laughs> the election. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, David. Uh, ah, wow. You are so special. Oh, that was amazing. Uh, uh, so when you put this together on a Facebook, you'll let me know because I never look at it. <laughs> and I won't remember. We'll get it all organized. Okay, so uh, before uh, we let you go, what's your, you've worked with, been around a lot of very uh, strong, successful, artistic people. What, what's your advice to Mandy and I getting through this up in Canada or just getting through it in general as, as people? What is your, what is your sense of how, how best to approach life at this point? Well, you're asking the wrong person because um, I don't know the answer to that, Dave uh, and Mandy. I, even before the pandemic, given our age, my barber and my age, we decided to build cocoons. So when we go up north to New York, we live literally in the middle of the woods. We don't see any house, we don't see any road. We just have beautiful trees and beautiful nature. And down here, we live on the Gulf of Mexico. It's not quite a cocoon as it is upstate New York, but we look at the Gulf of Mexico. So we have built physically cocoons. My problem is I don't know how to build a mental cocoon. I have tried very hard because I find it increasingly difficult to handle what's happening in the world and what's happening to my country. Um, I am just incapable of segregating myself mm. from current events. I just happened to come across in a book that I read uh, some citations to the uh, American philosopher, who's actually Spanish born, George Santayana. And Santayana, I learned spent the First World War in England uh, out of service. And he spent the end of the 30s to the end of the 40s in a monastery in Italy. And part of his philosophy was to enjoy the moment, but to, to detach himself from current events. So I just bought and received from Amazon a, a, um, a biography of Santayana because I want to see how he did it because uh, David Mandy, I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how he did it and I would love to be able to do it, but mm -hmm. I can't. So that's crazy. You asked the wrong person. <laughs> I don't think so. If you find <laughs> out the answer, would you please call me back <laughs> and, and let me know how you do it? And Mandy, what's your take on looking at paintings like this? I realize it's a different style and different time than you, but what is it like looking at this? Uh, it's one of the most enjoyable things in the world to me when I was going to, at the short moments that I was at university, art history was my absolute favorite because it's, it just, it says so much about the humans and the time and new concepts and new material and new it just it's just such an incredible way to to show history and show where we all are at that time and these paintings i'm always in awe of them because i i can definitely not create them 
Um, and I just, I think the, the richness and the quality and the, the time that they took to create these pieces is just, it's just so deep. And uh, yeah, I just, I love it. I'm so in awe. David, you are such a special human. I'm so excited that I got to meet you. <laughs> but uh, maybe one day I'll be able to, to paint like that. Maybe. So Rob, what about you? Do you hear all of this? <laughs> Uh, no, but did you hear the did you hear the uh, the art talk? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, uh, um, David, uh, I, again, I don't know if I've ever had an art talk. Well, I haven't had that many. I think you're the only person I've ever had speak about art and you're the only one I've heard do it in a swimsuit. So it's two for two. So I'm very excited. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. That was just tremendous. Uh, so tremendous. I'm going to go try and find a mental cocoon. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, wow. <laughs> we need it. Uh... Well, let's all find some good art because it's not just something to put on the wall. It's something to carry with you and carry through your life. Well, that, that's one approach to the current events, uh, Dave. I find myself, I, I've looked for years, and this was way behind, way, way beyond uh, the virus. I have always said, what we all need to be is what I call, we need to be beauty seekers. We need to be what I call wisdom seekers. And I find that more important today. Uh, Barbara and I have always tried to surround ourselves on a daily basis with something of beauty. It's more important today. Mm -hmm. Music is more important uh, today. When you started playing the ukulele, mm -hmm. it came to my mind. I am listening to more music uh, than I usually do. I, I listen a lot. It's a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of mental peace so good. beauty seekers well, let's be beauty be. seekers yeah right I oh do. yeah i buy it uh yeah. yeah do you want me to play a little ukulele for you to end it all off david yes <laughs> do that that would be great <laughs> i don't know like uh, like two tunes i don't know what i'm gonna do <laughs> I, what am I going to do? That's all I got, Dave. Or I used to do this. And... That's all you get. That's all you get. What a great neighborhood we have with David Lenefsky. And thanks. So no, I will. I want to take one last word. About Go ahead. Music. Yeah. And I don't want you to read anything psychologically into this, but my favorite music is Requiems. And so I want to pass on to you. All right. If you haven't recently heard, turn on, there are four great requiems. Brahms, Mozart, yeah. Berlioz, and Fauré. And they play an increasingly important role in my life, as I said. So that's my last word. Goodbye, guys. <laughs> Oh, okay. David. We'll say you're, you're, you're out. <laughs> oh, oh, that was God. amazing. Uh, oh, what was that, hey, man? Uh, like, and I was I'll be special. Like, I hope this is I hope other people are liking this because it was so fun. So uh what a guy. And I'm like wow. if you and I've He's been with me in New York uh, or at the Met when I did the one and only, and he'd stand in front of a painting and go, now, the year is 1256. And what you find? And then he'll do the talk. And then he says, and now, follow me. And then he goes off. And then you're like running after him. And you're going, uh, and now, look at this. And he's just like, it's crazy. He does his uh, whole thing. It's so good. It's so amazing. And his comprehension is just it's beyond oh. he's just so so cool thank you for that that ah. was 
Well, for yeah. the for the seven of us that are going to go crazy for it, or the seven million, it doesn't matter. I just wanted yeah. it for you and me, and then the rest can follow if they want. It's so great. Uh, so great. Yeah. And the beauty seekers, go be a beauty seeker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow afternoon, we're having a big party at four o'clock, uh, and I'm not going to say who's coming.